going to do a little experiment, and I need the troops now to run out with the papers, um, because you've been sitting patiently here um, until now. Uh, but my husband is always telling me, uh, put three Irish people in the room and people will sing. <laughs> now, you can see this one coming. Uh, I first want to see hands. How many Irish do we have in the audience? Can I see born and bred Irish people? Can they stand up so that we can see them? The Irish, the real Irish Irish, can they stand? <laughs> Applause for them. All right, you, you keep standing because basically what we're going to do now, I mean, you want to know who these thousand people are that were announced as being participating in this conference. Now, I want to see hands of people who actually think they are health workers in whatever capacity. Who feels he is a health worker? Health workers. All right. Now, I want to see people who say, well, besides being a health worker, I'm also a health administrator sort of policy person. Hands. Then I will see people who say, well, you know, it's cold outside, but it's warmer here. <laughs> All right. Um, then I want to see the Danes amongst us, because they're pitiful. <laughs> Any Danes in the audience? <laughs> All right. They're brave. They're brave. Anyway, even if you lose tonight, the Irish are very, very um, sort of coulant winners. So they, they are very generous in the way they win. Um, the serious business we're, we're going to talk about now is how we selected the song, because in a minute, I want all of you to stand up. This is also very good for the blood circulation. I want you to stand up and sing along with me this song. And I'm going to come down there to sing along with you. But I already had a little preparation for this song. Let me tell you how this went with the organizing committee, who's all very, very busy with the high-level statements of all the VIPs that were speaking. And I said, we need to get a song. So. The Irish tradition is full of beautiful songs, part of them in Gaelic, which half of the audience, of course, cannot pronounce. Um, the other half of the songs are a little bit like the blues. I'm now talking to my American and African friends. So a lot of death and dying and destitution, which for an opening ceremony is not really the best choice. So now we're here in Dublin, and a song which never, never, never fails to be good is the song that is now being handed out to you. And it's a song, it's called Molly Malone. Now, who already knows this song? Can I see hands of people who know? Because we need a choir, yeah? <laughs> this is gonna be our opening night karaoke. Um, I want a few people with me. So, some of the Irish, uh, we have young Kevin here. Kevin, please come up. <laughs> he's also gonna speak later on, but uh, applause for Kevin. He's the president of the, the Medical Students Association. Kevin. <laughs> Kevin, come up here, come up here. All right, I need, uh, I had a few Ugandan friends. They sing in church choirs, they're very good. So can I have a few Ugandans who actually I seduced to come and sing along here? Can I have some Ugandans, please? Can my Ugandan friends come to the front? You don't have to come on stage, you can just stand here. All right, I'll come down to you. I'll give a sign to Simon over there, and then we're gonna try this one. Everybody stand up, please, because you cannot sing sitting. in a minute. Simon, I count down from five to four to three to two to one. Let's have the tone. Let's have the tune.
Okay. <laughs> now we're talking. <laughs> all right. Now for all of you who are going to watch the game tonight or even go to the stadium, which is just across the road, there's another very fantastic song, but you know, we would have done a little bit of rehearsing. I was told by Kevin here because he sent me these things at 2 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> so the other song is The Fields of Ethan Rye. Now that we're going to do on the closing night, so prepare yourselves. Um, this is also, ladies and gentlemen, a little bit to say we apologize for being in this fantastic hall, but for Q&A, an intimate dialogue, this is a little bit complicated. Um, so we'll, we'll have a panel now, where the panel will be very much also to, to open up the discussions that we're gonna have through the next three days together. So you'll see in your program that there will be plenary panels um, every morning and every sort of after lunch. And these panels are mainly meant to, to get the thing going a little bit. Now, in terms of Q&A and dialogue, this is a bit hard because I can hardly see the people who are sitting at the back. And those people wave at me. I, yeah, okay, thank you very much. Because it, it, it feels like, I don't know. Um, so if you have burning questions, they can be discussed at the drinks afterwards. And it's gonna be very good drinks. We're here in Dublin, so everybody knows drinking is not um, a bad thing here. So a lot of... Now, I'm at the moment of the day when I'm going to sort of spill a lot of the beans, you know, like photos I got yesterday from all the hardworking uh, staff that we, we actually sent to the pub and say, please go and have a drink because you guys have been working so hard. So the nice films that came back really made me jealous. But anyway, this is all for later. We're now going to move to the real serious um, topic of the first panel. There are going to be six panels. And if you already have studied the whole program, you'll see there is a little crescendo movement in these panels. So we start with setting the scene a little bit further. We had already fantastic opening speeches, but we will have tomorrow a panel that will deep dive into the education dimension of this Human Resources for Health agenda. We have a panel that will talk about the innovation in labor markets. We have a panel that will talk about decent work. We have a panel that will talk about all the governance issues. And then, of course, the final panel will be about investment. Because you heard several speakers say, and I think this is the time for action, and this is all the, also the time to seriously invest. Now, investment is not only pecunia. Money, money matters, but it's not only money. So we're going to talk about all kinds of investments that people can make. And in order to stimulate the people who might want to make the hard financial pledges at the end, we also have a second initiative here that all of you I want to participate in. From tomorrow morning on, in the main marketplace, we have the selfie, I make a personal pledge thing. So basically, we'll put you with a photo, uh, we, we make a photo of every participant who on a board can make a personal pledge. I am, for this human resources and health agenda, gonna do X. Those 700 photos we're gonna assemble sort of by Friday, when people with money enter this room, they know that 700 people have already committed themselves, so there's no way they can refuse anything. <laughs> and so this is basically um, a little bit of a subplot, but that will be in the marketplace. So all the panels will lead up also to that moment of we invest together. That's personal investment, individual investment, and institutional investment, because we can keep talking, but basically this is the time for action. So I've talked already much too long, uh, but I'm now going to invite or esteemed guests, and in order of chairs, uh, I would like to invite the Honorable Minister Sarah Aching Openi from Uganda. You already saw her with the flag, but she's coming back. Sarah, Dr. Sarah. She is the State Minister of Health in Uganda, like you were already told, um, but she told me also a little bit of her background. She has a few passions. She has a passion in primary care. She was very many years very much involved in the primary care movement. She also has a passion in um, governance because she headed a lot of anti-corruption uh, forces um, in her country. She's very much also um, passionate about um, community health extension workforce. 
And this is all topics that she would like to uh, elaborate on a little bit in her opening remark. So very much welcome, Dr. Sarah. Uh, we already saw you, but we're very happy that you uh, could make it to Dublin. Now, next to her, um, we will invite, um, again, Susanna Jacob, um, WHO Regional Director for Euro. Um, already gave an excellent speech, opening up a lot of the conversation. Um, I, I can't help it, we had storytelling here yesterday, uh, health workers told stories. I also can't help sometimes to tell personal stories. I me actually met Dr. Jacob uh, many years ago when she was still active, very active in Hungary, her home country, to work on uh, better integration possibilities in Europe. So she's an astound European, uh, but also a astound world citizen, and she will talk on behalf of WHO uh, Euro here. Now, as a third speaker, I would love to invite um, Dr. Elsa Barrett Eikeland. Um, she is Honorable Ambassador for Norway here in Ireland. And she told me that she had been ambassador for the polar regions. Now, I've never in my life, I've met a lot of political people, but I've never met people who were ambassadors for the Poles, like the Arctics. So I asked her how was it? She said it was absolutely exciting and vital, as we all know, with the climate change. But now she's ambassador in Ireland, which is not so polar, but I think it's actually a very good place to be, and you love Ireland, I heard already. Now, it, Dr. Elsa is actually, um, in her background, also a long relationship with NORAD um, and with the development arena. So you have been in many places in the world uh, in that capacity. Now, and finally, you already saw him, uh, heard him mention, uh, we have Kevin McMahon. Do I pronounce this right? Mahan, okay, McMahon. Now, Kevin has been very busy with the people of the Youth Forum um, that were assembling here today all day. Can I see hands of people who are the Youth Forum representatives? So they're sitting in the back. They should be sitting in the front. <laughs> Guys, an applause for you, because you've been working all day on your own declaration. I think a warm applause for these guys. So, jokingly, we said, you know, we're talking about UHC 2030. I will happily retire by that, by that day. Most, well, Dr. Susanna can you also will be retired. So Kevin is probably the only one still working um, on, in 2030. So he has a right to speak, we feel, on behalf of all the young voices that are in this audience. So we're very, very happy with all of you here. Now, I have one opening question to all of you, and I, I start with you, um, uh, Dr. Sarah. We heard a lot of good words in the opening ceremony, but also in the last day with all the side events here. And a lot of people say times are really changing. Times seem to be changing. And so there are, in the arena now with the UHC agenda and the sustainable development goals, there are really new opportunities. Is this just rhetoric or is this true? First of all, um, I bring greetings to all of you from Uganda. Some people ask, where is Uganda? <laughs> Uganda is the pearl of Africa <laughs> and it's found in the East African region. As you get towards winter, I just want to request you, run away from the winter and come to Uganda. We don't have that kind of life. Of course, secondly, just allow me to also thank uh, the government of Ireland for the warm hospitality that has been accorded to me and my delegation from the time I arrived here. You will note that there is a football match, and I know many people love football. So we have to make this brief so that they can go and watch the match. <laughs> you can see. <laughs> Uh, but, of course, you have said uh, this is not just rhetoric. I think there's a lot going on in various countries. We made commitments to the sustainable development goals. We are all committed to universal health coverage. However, at the center of all these commitments is the human resources for health. And I really want to say that uh, various governments have made efforts in training health workers, recruiting them, and, of course, uh, uh, ensuring that they actually retain them in the countries. But of course, we all know that there is demand for the human resources for health everywhere. 
And of course, this migration, as we discussed in the morning plenaries, or the morning sessions will not end. But what I really want to say is that there is a lot going on, as just you have said, and what we must recognize as governments is that the development of any nation will not occur without investing in health. So the health of the people is paramount because when you have a healthy population, then definitely it will be a productive population. So I really want to say that a lot is going on. The world is becoming a global village, as you all know, and I want to put the issue of digital health on the agenda. I have not heard this being talked about, and yet it is key in helping us deal with some of the human resource health, or the health challenges that we are facing. At the center of digital health, of course also there are various innovations that we also need to embrace as governments, and these are issues that really is, just can't be rhetoric. There are a lot of innovations going on. We can actually reach doctors through, to, through our mobile phones. We can actually promote health using the phones, uh, the mobile phones. So there is a lot. It's not merely rhetoric. And therefore, investing in health is key. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> I've come to know Dr. Sarah, but she's always fast forwarding to, you know, where can we actually put the action? And this is what this forum is about. So I'm very happy <laughs> with your opening statement, Dr. Sarah. Um, Dr. Susan, back to you. Uh, you already explained how WHO, also WHO regionally, um, is, is very, very much committed uh, to this global agenda. Now, out of all the actions that you outlined already in your opening speech, if you say, well, we have to now select one urgent action first. Where are, where are the drivers of change that are for you the most interesting um, and that might help the agendas that you so eloquently laid out earlier? Well, first of all, let me say that I had a good opportunity to highlight our vision uh, for the health workforce in my opening speech. But there was one issue that I could not highlight, and this is the fact that, true, I am Hungarian by nationality, but our office is in Copenhagen, Denmark, and I have been living in Denmark for 20 years, and therefore I have a very strong feeling for the Danes, and I love them, so I have a split feeling tonight. So that is the first message. <laughs> Back to the topic. <laughs> of the health workforce. Are you talking to a Dutch woman and there's a bit of misery, of course, in that front? <laughs> um, of course, we have to take the SDG agenda very seriously because the SDGs put health and social well-being very central to development. And this is the link that we have to enforce, health and development. And this is what came out also so forcefully from the, from the UN Secretary General's uh, high-level committee. And that is absolutely key. But in order to move that forward, we really need political commitment. And I have to underline three times the need for political commitment. Because in countries where there is a high level political commitment to health and well-being and workforce development at the highest level, things are moving. So if we want all these uh, very welcome developments to turn into action, we need political commitment everywhere. Can I, can I interrupt you there just one second? Because Political commitment, I think everybody in the room will agree, is very important. And it's also very easily said we need political yeah. commitment. Now, at the same time, we all know that the political arena at this moment is, is quite complicated, yeah. to say the least. So where do you see drivers? You say, OK, I see from your perspective, I see opportunities in the political domain. Uh, and you don't have to mention countries or, or governments. But basically, where in the political arena do you see hope? Well, I think um, every country can decide to put health high on its agenda, irrespective of the political uh, setup in that given country. 
We have seen it in our regional committee recently where we invited high level leaders. We had prime ministers there, we had deputy prime ministers from countries where you can discuss different political issues, but if the political commitment for health and well-being and workforce development is there, then they can make tremendous progress. And I think that can take place in any country to, to, to have this political commitment. And the reason why you need this commitment is because all the agenda and all these policies that we have been discussing over the years, and we have been discussing and developing policies, they will only be turned into action if there is multi-sectoral activity, if there is involvement of the civil society, of partners, of, of all, the, all the communities that need to be involved, and that will not take place without political commitment. So I think that is the key for all the progress made, and I strongly believe that we have made good progress in the last few years, but we need more and more and more action now. So we have to focus on action to deliver on all those challenges that I highlighted in my speech. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Elsa, you, you told me uh, a little bit before this meeting that you had been in NORAD working a lot in the development arena, and now you're, as an ambassador, you also very interested in following up on what is happening in that domain. And you said, actually, I do see, you told me, you, you do see a lot of changes taking place. So where do you see the major changes at the moment, the drivers that might actually support this agenda? Well, um, it's great to be here. Uh, and just let me, uh, I'm ambassador here in Dublin, so just let me <laughs> Uh, bring the attention to the song we sang, uh, Molly Maloon, because I think that's a very good example of a woman who died because of lack of universal health coverage <laughs> in Ireland in those days. <laughs> and uh, I think Ireland and Norway, uh, just to add uh, um, what you said about uh, commitment and, and priorities, Ireland and Norway, used to be two of uh, Europe's poorest countries and uh, health universal health coverage and has, has changed the society, access to health, to equality, and the political commitment and willingness has really been very, very important. So uh, when I listen to all these uh, fantastic speeches and uh, knowledge, I was kind of wondering, why am I here as representing Norway? And I think I have one answer, and that's the Norwegian political commitment to health, to support the World Health Organization in development assistance and globally uh, in the United Nations. So uh, that's the most important uh, commitment uh, from Norway. When it comes to the strategic approach today, uh, I think I want to bring the attention to the migration of um, health workers, uh, since uh, not so many um, have mentioned this before. Uh, Norway has been very uh, keen to work with countries to ask the question, why are uh, health workers migrating? What can we learn to, what, what can we know about uh, the labor market? Uh, we are very happy about the increased cooperation between ILO, the World Health Organization, and OECD to find more about this. Because health workers are not only migrating to the north, but also to neighboring countries where there are better labor markets and a better policy. So how can we uh, assist countries to uh, develop better labor markets and also to develop the health competence they need? Uh, and uh, I just want to uh, echo what uh, the minister from uh, Uganda said about digital, uh, digital health. I think digital health and to do something about migration can really change uh, the way to universal health care. Now, in, in the various things you just mentioned, um, if you could reflect a little bit on, let's say, 10 years that you've now been in this arena, 
and you would have to mention one thing that really strikes you as, as a real window of opportunity that was not there 10 years ago. We already heard the digital revolution might actually offer opportunities. This was what uh, the minister said. But what would you feel is a driver that really you know, should deserve a lot of attention because that might be offering windows of opportunity for advancing this agenda? Where would you put your cards? Well, I think there's only one thing that, that can change this, and that's political will. That's all of us. That's the willing, willingness to invest in health and see that health is not only health workers, it's really uh, the values of the society, and it's really an investment in equality and in economic uh, development and growth. So I think that has changed. I think it's a much more focused, and it's not only people like us or health workers discussing this. This is on the uh, global agenda, and this is maybe the most important issue uh, on global policy. Okay. Um, back to, to Minister Sarah. Can, can I ask you, you hear everybody echoing the importance of political will. Now, you've been in the arena of talking about the health workforce, but also other dimensions of health systems improvement for a while. And political will is always easily said. Now, from your experience looking around you, where do you see maybe new signs of political will being really there? And where do you see signs of, let's say, obstruction, without mentioning names and numbers, but where, where do you feel the, 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 the flow is and where do you feel the obstruction is if you talk about political will? The political will, as um, most of the speakers have said, does exist. But political will without leadership is nothing. Political will without the commitment is nothing. You can make political statements, you can actually indicate, yes, we shall, we, we, we value health, but without committing the resources to health, then that is nothing. And this is where we normally have a challenge, in that because of the various competing priorities, uh, most of the political leaders look at health as a consumptive area. They do not look at it at, as an investment. And therefore, um, what we have been doing really is to bring the ministers of finance on board when we are discussing health issues, because that's where it all starts. And once the, uh, the ministers of finance are also on board to understand that the dollar that you put in health is actually an investment mm -hmm. and could bring in maybe $10, then there you are able to move forward. So the obstacle usually is on. You can have political will, but without the political leadership, then that is nothing. And of course, uh, I really also want to mention this very clearly, that we have to note that most of the developing countries suffer from the communicable diseases. We have a high burden of these communicable diseases which are actually preventable. And therefore, at the center of all this should be the community itself, should be the individuals. So we really have to bring communities and individuals in all this so that they understand that the first call lies with them to prevent the diseases. And when this is done, then we can be able to deal with the other diseases because you note that life expectancy is now improving. For instance, in my country now, it stands at 64 years, up from about 50, 53 years, some five, six years ago. And therefore, because of this improvement or increase in the life expectancy, we expect more of the non-communicable diseases. So there should be now a shift in dealing with the communicable diseases and focus more on tertiary care. So, and this is where we even lack most of the health workers. So focus should really shift in having most of those specialists that actually will be able to deal with these non-communicable diseases. Okay. So you say two things. First of all, you say bring, bring communities in. Now I want to check in the audience here. Who is here represented that says, I'm really sitting here on behalf of community perspectives on all this, on, on the... Can you please stand up so that we can see who stands? So I see one woman here. 
because you say we have to bring in people with community perspectives. I see one woman here. Are there, are there more? Because even the minister. <laughs> even you. <laughs> so this is a long way to go. <laughs> <laughs> this is a long way to go, but I applaud you for being here. You're, you're the flag bearer. Um, no, but so again, something might be said and importantly said, but we see in a hall like this, uh, you are representing, you, you feel you're really representing community perspectives here. Okay. Um, Dr. Susan, you were also pointing out a, a whole range of things how this thing about you know, more investment uh, rather than seeing this as a cost, seeing it as an investment. So the political leaders also have to be convinced of this. Now you work in Euro, but you also work in the global arena. How do we get this transition from thinking about health as a cost to thinking about health as an investment? Because I remember, and my hair is gray, I'm an old mama. I remember a WHO report after WHO report underlining that health is not a cost, but an investment. So here we are, 2017, approaching 2018, and it's, the case still needs to be made. So what is, what, is, what is not going right? Now we are turning these messages into real evidence and data. And I think that's the way to go, to convince prime ministers, finance ministers, to have data of how much you lose if you don't deal with the high disease burden in the country, how much you lose from the economy. And now more and more data is coming out from the European Observatory in the European region, from our colleagues in Copenhagen, but also globally. And these are the data that we really need, that 1% of the GDP is lost if you don't invest in this or that disease. That is shocking for a prime minister, and he will immediately raise his head. In one of my presentations in a European country where there was a very high disease burden and the prime minister was sitting in the room, I made this calculation, we made this calculation before, and I told him that you lose approximately 12 to 15 percent of the GDP every year through direct and indirect costs because you don't invest enough into the health system. He immediately woke up and started to pay attention. So I think these are the data that we really need. So that's one thing I want to highlight. The other thing is that we need to interconnect these policies. And that is the good thing also in the SDGs, that policies are interconnected. We cannot look at workforce issues in isolation. We have to look at it in terms of the improvement you want to achieve in health outcomes, in terms of the reduction you want to achieve in inequities in health, in terms of health system strengthening and development, universal health coverage, financial protection. Just looking at the European scene, uh, we said in Tallinn, in the Tallinn Charter 10 years ago, that nobody should become poor because of developing a disease or being sick. And we still have about 18 million people just in the European region, which is the most well-doing region in terms of financial income and, and financial economic development, who are impoverished through high level of out-of-pocket payment because they cannot afford to pay for the health care costs. So they either eat or they pay for the health care costs. This is totally, totally unacceptable. So I think these are the sort of information and messages that we have to bring back to the, to the presidents, to the prime ministers, and to the finance ministers to convince them to invest more into the health system. Okay, so it's not only political will, it's political mm. commitment coupled, of course, with, with financial resources. Mm. I, I had the same question for, for Mrs. Eklund because as an ambassador, of course, you also advise your government uh, back and forth. Mm -hmm. And so this, this case, this case of human resource sources in health, um, we all know that the Norwegians uh, have pledged a lot to, to help advance uh, the UHC 2030 agenda. But still, uh, we're with these persistent um, issues like in some places the case still needs to be made. It's an investment, it's not a cost. So from your experience, where, where do you feel the bottleneck is and how can we maybe start to approach that bottleneck differently? 
Well, I think it's important to repeat the same message, like uh, investment in health is important and leads to economic uh, development. And uh, all of you here, you know the statistics better than me, that there has been much more pledges. The world has moved in a positive way. Let us not forget, because otherwise we get so pessimistic and kind of negative and everything is, you know, getting worse and worse. So there is positive uh, developments in Uganda, in African countries globally. I think uh, for Norway and Europe, Africa, Latin America, whatever, I think in the future it will really be a focus on access to health, not only to privileged people, uh, but to to women, to uh, disabled people, to people who we don't see uh, every day. So I think that's the big step in Norway and, and across the world to, to give uh, access to uh, disabled persons and to underprivileged groups. But health is the most important one issue every time we uh, elect politicians. You know, what kind of health service do we get? And Norwegians in general, they have very good health service, but they feel they have terrible, huh? So um, we're very privileged, but I would assume that that's a big question in all countries of the world. And that has changed uh, the last 10, 15 years. So I'm very optimistic. Okay. Not everybody in the back row can see the face of, um, of Dr. Eckeland when she's saying this, but she really looks convinced that she, she is optimistic. Yes. So I'm going to move to uh, the optimistic generation. I was actually present at the Youth Forum uh, this morning a little bit, um, very much impressed by the positive energy in that, uh, in that group. So Kevin, totally against your character. You've been silent for the last half hour. Um, I know this young man a little bit, and uh, he has what they call the, the gift of the gap. Um, Kevin, you've been listening to this now. You are the future. In 2013, you're basically, you know, you're a young doctor now. You're, you might be the Minister of Health of this country. Who knows? <laughs> um, so listening to all this, are you an optimist or a pessimist? Um, I'm an optimist, absolutely. Um, I'm an optimist, I suppose, firstly, because the fact we that... We promise you would speak very I know, slowly. I'm sorry, my sorry, accent, sorry, sorry. Slowly and clearly. Um, so, firstly, I suppose I'm an optimist because of the fact that we're here. Youth is, youth is here, represented for the first time. Um, and this is the fourth, obviously, global forum, but the first youth forum. And I suppose we have to be very thankful for that. To yourself, God leave, to Dr. Campbell, uh, to all the members of the, the Human Resources for Health Department in Geneva, that you youth have a voice and we have a seat at the table. Um, and I, I suppose, I don't know, would we be able to get everybody to stand up who is present maybe at the forum today? Would you mind if you don't get jelly legs, please? Thank you. Okay, guys, this is the future. One applause for the future. <laughs> Great, and I wanted to highlight everybody who's been present. So we had over 100 people registered from all around the world. Um, and kind of we want to highlight that all of these people who are present here at the Youth Forum and at the Main Forum indeed, they're, they're not only the leaders of tomorrow, but they're the leaders of today. Um, they're here sitting at the high table and we want to be a part of uh, all the this, 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 ah, decision-making processes uh, that, that are happening here in Dublin and across the world um, on an annual basis. Um, we are advised by some of our expert speakers today um, in colourful language, firstly, to, to be impatient, to always be impatient, to always drive your agenda, to, to never wait for others to, to pursue your goals. We are advised by another expert speaker to be hungry, which at times we were today physically. But uh, <laughs> we, we are to be met metaphorically hungry, always wanting more, always wanting to drive forward. And thirdly, we're advised by Adrian, one of our expert speakers this morning, to be, uh, when we're at these forums, when we're at these high events, to, to bite, 
to, I, I don't know, literally bite as I wouldn't be the, the best house guest, but, but to, to be participatory and, and to be a, an active voice and not just to be there to be um, as a token gesture, which I know we, we aren't here as, but to actually participate and to bring our objectives to, to a global scale. Um, many youth organisations are very active on a local and national scale, but this is a prime example of youth being given the opportunity to actually put forward their mandate for, for how they were elected and to bring it uh, to, to the many, many qualified people who are here in Dublin. Okay, Kevin, now I, I can already see your pledge. So you're going to take the photo and the pledge is going to be, I bite. <laughs> and that, so, so far it's been just a bit of friendly barking, but if you listen to what you've heard so far, mm -hmm. also in the ceremony, uh, you've, you've done um, your own sort of declaration and action plan today. So g first could you give us a few highlights and then say from that action plan, how are you listening to the opportunities and challenges that are being presented here? Mm. Absolutely. So, so some of the wording has been used already, I suppose. Um, kind of the, tag, the tagline for the, the, the call for action, uh, which is as, as it's been phrased, is health workers are not an investment, not a, uh, but a, uh, sorry, health workers are... I, com I completely muddled that up, sorry. Health workers are an investment, not a cost, and at that, a smart investment. Um, I I've heard some people mention here already about the fact that there's migration of workers occurring. Um, I suppose we have to ask the question, who's migrating? In, in the majority of cases, it's youth, and I suppose many different um, aspects of modern life, the fact that, say, we can get cheap flights, a lot of places, um, have, they they've moved on hugely in the last number of years, so we are given the ability to migrate. But in terms of looking at the factors which are making people migrate, youth have to be involved in that process. They have to be involved in that process from when they're in school, from when they're in university, from when they're working in the workforce. And something in the workforce may want to cause them to move. So okay, but then, then substantively, yeah, because I'm very interested, what would you phrase or say differently from what you've heard so far? So on the issues that we discussed, for instance, the political will issue. Uh, there's report after report about political will is important. Now, all of us will agree. What would somebody from a youth forum say to political will? What, what, what would be your comments? Also, other people from the youth forum, they, they can come stand up and say, uh, if you have answers to these questions. But I also want to see where the difference lies in the perspectives that you are developing today from the perspectives that people of my old generation might have. Absolutely. So I, I'd maybe say that w words are one thing, actions are another. So we, we've already heard that the first couple of four have looked at um, assessing and kind of getting a baseline assessment of where things are at. And at this four, we're actually uh, taking things forward and making adjustments ba based off those. Where we would um, perhaps add a different perspective is the fact that when we're looking at the health, uh, health force of 2030, 2050 and beyond, who, who are they? They're, they're us. They're, they're the people that, uh, the delegates from all around the world. So we need to look at w what has changed in the workforce environment from um, when many of the delegates here were starting out their careers, either a few or many years ago, um, and what may, that, what may differ in terms of the working environment that, that I may be working in. We've heard people talking already about say social media we've heard people talking about um, kind of the differences that exist in my day-to-day -day life from from many years before so we, we need to get kind of a stock take um, of currently what the situation is for both graduates and students um, that would make them say want to be first of all a healthcare worker and then may want them to, to be a part of a health workforce in another country or, or in another sector. Um, looking at the reasoning and rationale behind it in a proactive way as opposed to making reactive adjustments I think is key and something that youth should be involved in as will be the people who are taking up those positions in the near future. Okay, now again people cannot, I, you can clap her because he is really the voice of uh, 100 people in this audience. And actually, uh, when we have the Dublin Declaration later this week, uh, we'll also have the Youth Forum Declaration. So that will be very interesting to compare uh, what is what. Now, I was warned there is a football match on this evening. Um, so we'll have another 10 minutes. I'm looking at, is that okay? And in these 10 minutes, um, we're going to take up three minutes of your time. What you can do now, because I heard a little bit of buzz, I can see some people already talking to their neighbors. I give you three minutes to talk a little bit amongst yourselves about what you feel should now be discussed before we go to the football match. Um, <laughs> so um, it's five to seven on my watch, so it's still seven o'clock. Talk a little bit with your neighbor, and then we do a, sh a short round in the hall 
uh, because we have our esteemed panelists here. You have heard a little bit what their positions are, opening up the discussion for Dublin. Um, but five minutes, and then I'll come to you with the mic, and we'll take a couple of questions back to the forum, and then we'll end. Um, is that okay? I'm looking at Rania, she's my big boss here. Um, is that all right? That's all right. Okay, so you have five minutes now to talk legally to your neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> and do the phone calls you wanted to do. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm a very strict moderator and your two minutes are up. I'm just gonna say Molly Malone and everybody gets silent. All right. I have one gentleman here who was indicating that he wanted to say something briefly, and he's the Honorable Minister of Health of Guinea. So, ladies and gentlemen, can I have your attention? We're going to take, we'll definitely finish this session by quarter past seven. So, not to worry, all of you can be out in time. But before then, I'm gonna, maybe we can stand up and watch. Can I have a, one applause for one of our esteemed guests, the Ministry of Health of Guinea? I'm, I'm very, very honored to meet you again, um, Dr. Diallo. He, he made a few beautiful remarks already today, some of which cannot be repeated in public because of Chatham House rules. Um, but, I know uh, Dr. Diallo is one of the people that is very, very um, passionate about this agenda, but also critical about progress. So what question would you like to maybe pose or comment you would like to make to this panel? Well, first of all, I would like to uh, thank uh, the organizers for inviting me. And um, I'm happy that um, human resources uh, is really at the center of discussion. There's absolutely no health. There's absolutely no development without human resources. And um, the part of the discussion that really caught my attention that I liked the most was the debate around um, investment uh, versus expense. I mean, uh, it, it is sad that it, that question is even in the t on the table. I totally subscribe to what uh, my colleagues said here. Uh, it is an investment, and, and the, I guess the, the, the boss expression for it right now is uh, the demographic dividend. There is absolutely no development if you don't invest in health, if you don't invest in youth, if you don't invest in education. Uh, I come from Guinea, so as 
a lot of people know in the room here, Guinea went through its worst uh, uh, health episode with the Ebola disease outbreak. So we saw how a health issue could actually bring an entire country, an entire economy down to its knees. So, um, and I think everyone can, can learn from that experience and um, pretty much answer that question. It is an investment, there's no question there. So uh, I have no question for them. I subscribe to what they said and I'm happy that uh, the, once again the discussion is around human uh, resources. Uh, there was a, a little confusion earlier. You asked a question about uh, the perspective from the community. I think it was not clear to me. I looked at my, uh, my uh, friend and, uh, uh, and Minister of Health from, from Uganda looking at me and wondering why I didn't say anything because I thought you really wanted someone from the community to say something. But I'm a big advocate of our community health system. I think those who came to uh, the session earlier today heard me say it. Uh, definitely for developing countries, there is no improvement of health indicators without investing in human resources uh, that go closer to the community that deliver an integrated package of health services uh, for improving their health. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Thank you very much, Dr. Diallo. Now, before we get the wrong sort of Twitter storms, which is always a risk in this time and age, um, I now want to put this thing back to the vote. So who says, well, actually, I'm a strong supporter of more community involvement, and I'm actually also, like Dr. Diallo says, I'm very, very strongly a believer that that needs to happen. Can I see hands? Now, see, this is much better. So can we take pictures and tweet these ones? <laughs> because that earlier picture was pretty dramatic, huh? one woman. <laughs> So, but she's happy, I can see. Okay, you, so you have a lot more allies now, so this is really good. Um, I'm gonna do a little walk through the hall and I promised we stop this little walk at seven minutes past. So I'm, I'm walking now. And people who by their little bilateral conversation said I have something I really now want to contribute. I cannot wait till tomorrow. Um, this is your chance. You only have it once. State your name and short and sharp. <laughs> so, Miata, uh, I'm from Liberia. I work for the Ministry of Health. And I work for the Ministry of Health. Um, I want to go back to the point on um, political will, um, commitment. Um, and I was just reflecting a little bit and discussing with my colleagues. A lot of times we come to these fabulous conferences. Um, there are leaders that come to this conference that make a lot of commitment as to what they're going to do when they get back home. Um, and there's usually that conversation of accountability. So we sign off mm. everything about this wonderful investment that we are talking about. We want countries to invest in, in, in human resource for health. We want donors to invest in human resource for health. But where is that point at which we can hold countries accountable for the commitment they make at these very large forums? What sort of uh, accountability mechanism is there mm. to say, hey, you all sign off to this agreement that we're going to do the best we can for health workers. We had the last conference, there were wonderful things that were said. Have we taken stock? Mm of those commitments we made in 2013. So I think that should be a conversation. We should start to uh, develop a mechanism that we can hold countries accountable for the commitment they make in these nice forums. Okay. <laughs> now, here is one for you. <laughs> so who was in receive, for instance? Who of you was there? the last conference on the Human Resources for Health. So you cannot be held accountable for those ones. <laughs> All right, but you have signed on and signed off on other declarations of commitment. So I start with you, Dr. Sarah. Um, in answer to what the lady here says, what should happen if nice pledges are made? How can we hold you as minister, for instance, how can we hold you as signatory to many important statements further to account? We the citizens. Tough question. I think what I can say is that um, the biggest challenge that we have, and I mentioned this before, is the turnover of the political leaders. 
You can see the technical staff are there for years. 15 years or so, you are in the health sector. But you find that the political leaders, one, two years, you have another minister of health. And this is where the challenge is, because now the new minister may not know what exactly the previous minister had started. Because um, you live and go, and another one comes with a different problem. So that's where uh, the, there is a bit of a problem. But of course, that's not really, um, that should not be the excuse, because these uh, commitments that we make, the declarations, are actually on paper. And I must also say that maybe it's also the nature of the way these conferences are made. Because if a number of countries attended the previous conference, I think the starting point is to see what have these countries that were present in the previous conference done. Mm. But that is missing. We normally start off afresh and proceed. So it is you conference as you go, <laughs> if I can use that word. So I think you're very right that we need uh, these, um, you need to hold the leaders accountable. But I also want to say that I know that a lot has gone on in various countries. I mentioned this before in the morning. My country, for example, previously, we had one university that was actually training medical doctors. This has grown over the years public. I'm not talking about the private. There are about five universities now, public universities that government has invested in, and these are all churning out um, health workers or the doctors. But the challenge is the retention of these medical workers in the country, because you find a neighboring country paying them better, and you cannot hold them in the country. So this is where we have to find ways of really motivating our own health workers so that they can stay in country. But I want to sum this up that a lot of commitments have been made at global level. A lot of declarations have been made and signed off. I think, as was mentioned earlier, it's time for us to act. Let us use this period before 2030 to put our commitments into action. Okay, can I have one applause for everybody who agrees with this last statement? This conference is gonna be about action. Thank you so much. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Um, I saw Dr. Eklund also wanted to respond to this one, so first to you. Maybe uh, declarations from conferences like this should be made more public and more action-oriented, and not only to people like ourselves. But I think uh, accountability is a key in all politics, uh, on a national level especially. And politicians that are not accountable should not be re-elected. I mean, it's a democratic process, what a wonderful and the world community, that would be. Uh, the community um, involvement is important to set a standard for accountability. So, accountability, as you said, is not a play word. It's really, really what we're all here uh, doing now. So, thank you for bringing that up. Well, yes, I think another applause for her. Um, I'm, I'm watching my watch and somebody's going to pull my leg if, um, but basically what you just said is also going to feed into a session that will be, one of the panels will be on governance uh, and we'll definitely take this one up. So chapeau to you, uh, also one of the young leaders by the way. Um, so we, we have a very, very um, good extra point I think for the governance panel. Um, Dr. Suzanne, and then I want to give Kevin the final word, and you can already prepare yourself. <laughs> so if you were held accountable uh, 30 years from now, what, what should people be able to ask you? Um, but Dr. Suzanne first. I am very pleased that this accountability issue was raised, and thank you very much. Uh, accountability exists at various levels. There are national accountabilities, there are international accountabilities, and we all have to have an accountability framework to report back. And a conference like this, for example, should start by reporting back on what has been implemented from the declaration of the previous third uh, global forum. And uh, there should be a report for discussion here. And I think this is absolutely key and we have to take it forward. I don't know if it was done, so that's point one. Point two is that the way how we develop such declarations is also absolutely key 
because if there is a proper consultation process, then the member states and whoever approve it will feel ownership for its development and also for the implementation. So I think there are many issues that we should consider under this, and it's not uh, just uh, uh, a, a topic for a two minutes discussion, but we should continue with this in the coming years. Definitely. Thank you so much. Kevin, before I give you the floor, um, I saw that um, Jim Campbell was also, he's one of the um, people that would like to respond, I think, to this one, also probably the, the continuation between conferences, maybe. So, um, point very much taken, and there is a session on, <coughs> excuse me, what has happened since Brazil. Uh, I'm recognizing that the Recife political declaration and the commitments uh, were taken up and taken forward. We had an independent review. Uh, where's the author, Remco, there? It will be presenting the results. It's already been published in the journal in terms of what the commitments taken last time round and the achievements. And I must commend all the countries and institutions. When you look at the progress, it's been extremely positive. Okay, so Remco van der Paas, who's sitting there, is waving. You can uh, approach him during over drinks. Um, he is definitely going to answer all the questions you still might have on this progress report. Uh, he's not looking happy now because he also wanted to go to the football match, but it doesn't matter. Um, I just killed his evening, sorry. Um, on a serious note, this opening panel has been absolutely fantastic in terms of opening the atmosphere in which we want to proceed together. Um, there, yesterday were really fantastic side events where in, of course, smaller rooms, people can look each other in the eyes and talk seriously about all the topics. Um, you'll see there's a fantastic logic in the program, building up uh, this action agenda, and not only in rhetoric, but in terms of concrete examples, best practices, sharing uh, and sharing perspectives. Um, so that by come to Friday, um, all of us on an individual and institutional level can be committed to carrying this further, this agenda of the human resources in health workforce. Now, Kevin, being the UHC 2030 only living worker then, at least, <laughs> I'll, give, I'll give you the honor of the pre-final words. So, question to you, what, what could you be held accountable for? Were you a leader in that beautiful 2030? I'm being shoehorned into something here. Um, so uh, just, just on the point as well that Dr. Campbell and people were talking about there in terms of holding people accountable, um, I, I think a lot can be learned from student organizations on that point. Every year people are, are elected to student organizations. Every year people come with a mandate to student organizations. Every year people have to evaluate themselves and others in student organizations. That means that at these conferences that happen a couple of times a year, uh, usually biannually for most large student organizations, there's these tedious, at that, that, at that time that they're tedious anyway, five to six hour evaluation report sessions where people are set down and they're quizzed on what, what, what did you do? What, what did you say that you're going to do and did you actually do it? And then should they wish to go for other positions, that's then in the knowledge bank of, of all the delegates who are in attendance. So I, I think in terms of looking forward to 2030 and looking forward to evaluation mechanisms, I think that really has to be the focus point for 2030. We've set all of these targets, we've set all of these ambitions based off all of the different data collection mechanisms that we had. But what, what markers are in place in 2030 to ensure that we actually uh, first of all, have the right assessment of how we did, and then looking forward, what about after 2030? Uh, what, what if we don't meet the markers? What, what's the contingency plan to ensure that um, should we not meet these targets, which I, I think we mentioned today, there's only about 10 or 12 percent of countries, I may be wrong, are actually on, on track to meet those targets. What, what are we going to do? And proactively, what can we do now to actually change that trajectory to ensure that more countries, higher percentages of countries actually meet those targets? Uh, we need to be more proactive as opposed reactive, as I mentioned, um, and hopefully by 2030 we'll have fully encompassed that uh, pro-action as opposed to reaction. Okay. Thanks very much, Kevin. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Minister of Uganda, um, Dr. Jakob, um, Mrs. Eigeland, and Kevin Mann. Now, we have, um, because of course there were there are several organizations that have been very, very um, active in also shaping and promoting this, uh, this new agendas. And so we have a video message from 
I'm looking at our technicians there. Dr. Gurria, he's going to speak to us. Um, OECD, um, who wants to, at the end of this first um, panel, wants to greet us on behalf of the OECD. So that video can now start. Okay. He will speak tomorrow. <laughs> That's very good. You know, have a nice opening statement tomorrow. You know, tomorrow is another day. This is very good. Um, so this saves us another two minutes. Um, I am now going to give the microphone back to. After, by the way, thanking our panel again, and they can <laughs> happily come down the stage. Yes. Can I bet? Can you? Can I bet? Bet. Okay. I want to bet today's scores. <laughs> One nil in favor of. <laughs> in favor of Ireland. <laughs> All right. She is a Minister of Health, she's careful, you can see that one nil, and of course it's going to be much more exuberant scores. Um, I wish all the Irish good luck, I can say from the bottom of my heart as a Dutch woman who went through the misery of seeing her own team disappear from the field altogether. Um, but you are going to win, I'm sure, the Irish and the Danes, you know, you can come to my room and we uh, mourn together about the losses. Um, the drinks um, that are served by the... Um, Mr. Our minister is, is here to speak. Would you okay, explain? yes, and I heard that the minister has come back and he wants to finally uh, finalize the meeting. So I'll give the floor. Sorry, I. Uh, Excuse good evening. me, ladies and gentlemen. The good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Kate Mila Forger to all of you. 100,000 welcomes to Dublin and to Ireland. And first off, may I thank most sincerely Minister Opendi for a very helpful prediction, uh, hoping that her uh, expertise in fortune telling uh, brings fruits to us this evening. Um, I want to welcome you all to the official opening of the fourth Global Forum on Human Resources for Health. We have delegates here this evening from 90 countries all over the world, and your presence is testament to the commitment of countries to advance the implementation of the global strategy on human resources for health. And I want to thank each and every one of you for making the journey here, and I want to thank in particular the World Health Organization for their role in organizing this fourth global forum. The world over the last decade or so has become in many ways a global village ever more connected. And this is evident in the area of human resources for health. We have doctors, nurses, and carers from many different countries who work in our hospitals and clinics. And among the Irish diaspora are workers fulfilling similar positions in other healthcare systems. And at the same time, illness and disease does not respect bound borders and boundaries, and healthcare professionals in all of our countries must work together to address our shared challenges. This week's gathering provides an essential opportunity to take the next step forward, to move from the development of ideas and the design of strategies, all of which have been based on better understanding of the issues and challenges, to the equitable and sustainable distribution of health worker skills. That's going to be a challenge, and like all other things worth doing, but it also represents a very, very unique opportunity. And across the OECD, uh, the health sector is a leading and growing source of employment, representing approxim approximately 11% of jobs. And globally, the World Bank projects a doubling in the economic demand for health workers, with 40 million jobs to be created in that sector over the next 15 years. That is an opportunity to drive economic growth, to create decent work and employment, and to deliver quality health services to all of our citizens. And as such, human resources for health is an issue that sits right at the very nexus of so many issues, including um, inclusive economic growth, uh, resource mobilization, education and training, and indeed gender equality. And in our policy discussions on health, 
we need to frame the conversation on workforce planning as an investment. Uh, the economic return on investment in health is $9 for every dollar spent. And in addition, all over the world, jobs in the health sector are inclusive of women. In Ethiopia, for example, female health extension workers are the backbone of the health extension program, providing services to their communities. So the challenge this week is to put our heads together, our collective experience and our wisdom, uh, to find innovative ways to drive forward the implementation of our global strategy on human resources for health. And I say our not because this strategy is Irish, but because it is everyone's strategy. We all have an interest in its success. And this forum, and you spoke about it just a couple of minutes ago, this forum should yield tangible actions that we can all stand over and work towards. And Ireland has a very long history of support for health and development through our development cooperation program. We are particularly focused on improving access to quality basic health services for poor and for marginalised citizens, reaching those who are most in need. And this makes human resources for health a priority issue for us, because if we do not have a trained workforce in place to serve those communities who are most in need, we're not going to achieve the goals that we have all set for ourselves. So Ireland also works at a global level with our partners in the Global Health Workforce Network and in the World Health Organization and with governments in our partner countries, many of whom are here today to achieve that very, very worthy and worthwhile goal. I recently visited Tanzania and there I met with healthcare workers and was impressed by the commitment that they showed to improving the lives of those around them. Ireland is supporting the training, the recruitment and the deployment of community health workers in conjunction with the Ministry of Health and a health NGO in Masasi to strengthen community health structures, work that I believe is absolutely vital. And as a department, we have always tried to implement a people-centred approach in our work on health and speaking with the healthcare workers on the ground who transform policy into action really enforces the value of what we do. The world needs an additional 18 million health workers by 2030, and that is no small challenge. We need to ensure that each of us works not just to make working in health attractive to new professionals, but also that we encourage those already working within the system to stay committed, to stay energised and to stay engaged. Your presence here in Dublin is a manifestation of your dedication and your commitment to working together to transform our global health workforce. Together, you have the power to keep human resources for health on the agenda and to ensure that our future health needs of all of our countries can be met with well-trained, motivated and quality health workers. That will not only have a positive impact on health, but on each of our countries more broadly. So, ladies and gentlemen, let me once again wish you the warmest of welcomes to Dublin and to Ireland. I am sure that the forum ahead will be engaging, will be interesting and indeed challenging. I will be following your work with great interest and I look forward to seeing those very tangible actions that stem from this important gathering. And I'm sure that the hard work being done by the delegates here today and the work on the Dublin Declaration will go a long way in working to transform our global health workforce. I hope that you enjoy your time here in Dublin uh, and I look forward to meeting you throughout the week ahead. And I would like to invite you all to partake in some renowned Irish hospitality by joining us in our, in our reception outside. And once again, may the best team win this evening. I wish you all a wonderful time in Dublin. Thank you.